give us. I, I'll just go through, I'll just let you know again, this is my, these are my contact details. My name is Nerissa Leung. I uh, am nerissaleung at gmail.com. I don't have a Basto email address, so please don't look for me at Basto. And these are my other um, contact details. I am Auslit Teacher on Facebook, Instagram, and I have a website, Auslit Teacher. And if you're a literacy teacher or instructor, I share resources on there related to literacy. So uh, usually mentor texts and uh, blog posts around literacy instruction. So you might want to have a look at that. So sorry about the sound problem. It's a very first time. That's OK. First time for everything. OK, so talking about talk, we obviously aren't in an environment where we can turn and talk uh, face to face to the other people in the webinar. You might be lucky enough to be in a room with someone else and you can turn and talk to them. Uh, but we realize that some of you are coming to us as lone rangers. So we set up the webinar with a back channel, uh, which means that you can type into a Padlet and have a conversation with other people. So you can see the Padlet address on the screen here, and I would encourage you all to visit this Padlet. If you haven't downloaded the resource pack that was emailed out, then you can access the resource pack uh, in this Padlet. The team from the department have posted it there. And there are some activities in, the, in that resource pack that I refer to during this session. And it'd be very handy if you had a copy of them, because at some stage, I'm going to ask you to go and access those resources. So padlet.com forward slash basto forward slash lit teach math. Now, the great thing about the Padlet is that it's available after we finish this webinar tonight. So if anyone posts some terrific resources on there, then you can always go back to that same Padlet address and access the conversation and the resources and the links. So uh, just remember that. So I've put that this quote here, talk plays a central role in learning how to think and in talking your way into meaning. And that's why we have this back channel or this Padlet so that we can, because we don't have that face-to-face -face opportunity, we can still engage in talk and discussion with other people who are coming to the session via that address. So I strongly recommend that you put any uh, links in there and uh, it'd be lovely to see who's with us tonight. So uh, maybe you're a maths teacher, maybe you're a literacy teacher, maybe you're a literacy leader in your school. It'd be lovely to hear who you are and where you're from and what your role is. And it sort of helps us to think about uh, the resources that you might need to assist you in your role. OK, so the understanding goals for tonight, if you've been to the other webinars on we've had science and English so far, you'll, you'll be very familiar with these understanding goals. You will understand the importance of explicit teaching of disciplinary literacy. And we're going to actually unpack that idea of disciplinary literacy. What is it and why does it matter? Develop knowledge of a range of effective disciplinary literacy related teaching practices. And the final one, deepen knowledge of a range of supporting resources. So specifically, we're going to be talking about the Literacy Teaching Toolkit Mathematics there, which is available now to have a look at. The success criteria for tonight, you're going to be able to describe reasons why explicit teaching of disciplinary literacy is important. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to list a range of practical literacy activities for the mathematics classroom and reflect on your current practice. And you'll also be able to list a range of supporting resources for ongoing learning. So of course, we would love to be able to deliver you everything you need to know about literacy in the mathematics classroom tonight. Uh, we don't have that much time though, and no one wants to be sitting here for that long listening to me waffle on. So tonight, it's really just a tasting plate. It's an introduction. It'll, it's, you know, it's a bit of a launch pad so that you'll know where to go. If you find yourself in the position where you just happen to have uh, maybe a few spare free days coming up, then you'll be able to spend all of your time on the Literacy Teaching Toolkit Mathematics, getting to know it inside out. How useful would that be? All right, so the agenda is, first of all, we're going to talk about the what and why of disciplinary literacy. Then we're going to look at the toolkit, the mathematics, literacy teaching toolkit mathematics. And finally, we're going to go in a bit deeper, looking at vocabulary in the mathematics classroom. And if you joined us from for the science one, you'll know that I, I've selected vocabulary as the area to dive deeper into because I think particularly math science is a really fertile ground for some explicit teaching around vocabulary that can pay dividends with our students. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get up to that section tonight. 
Okay, let's start, dive right in. So we're going to talk about the what and why of disciplinary literacy. Now this, I, this disciplinary literacy might be a new concept to you, totally fine, that's why we're going to talk about it tonight. All right, so I've just, I'm going to start with a couple of quotes just to introduce this concept of disciplinary literacy. Given the distinct ways different academic disciplines use language to make their own meanings, students need to develop differentiated literacy skills and strategies for interacting with the texts of each discipline. So I guess what I'm saying, what I'm, I guess the provocation that I want to start with here is why doesn't the English teacher teach the students everything they need to know about literacy? You know, I'm, as a maths teacher, I have all of the content that I need to teach myself, and now you want me to go and teach literacy on top of it. it surely it's the English teacher's job. So that's the provocation that I'm putting here, putting out. And I want to explore this idea of disciplinary literacy and why does the why do mathematics teachers need to uh, to take notice of this idea of disciplinary literacy and how does it help us to teach our content more effectively? So it is no longer appropriate to talk about literacy across the curriculum. Instead, there is a need to delineate curriculum literacies specifying the interface between a specific curriculum and its literacies, rather than imagining that there's a singular literacy that could be spread homogeneously across the curriculum. Now, you might find yourself in a, in a school where you have been talking about literacy across the curriculum. This is not to say that what you've been doing is wrong, but it is to say that as the research changes, then we need to be keep up with the research. And the current research is suggesting that we need to shift our focus from that concept of literacy across the curriculum more towards this idea of disciplinary literacy. All right, so that literacy across the curriculum, maybe general literacy, uh, on the left you might see this, uh, the tri this table here. You may have uh, experienced a time when we taught comprehension strategies across each of the disciplines, across each of the KLAs in a secondary school. You know, so we might have had a staff meeting where we all talked about predicting and what does that look like in maths and what does it look like in science and how can we apply it in each discipline. Uh, questioning, inferring, all of those different comprehension strategies. Uh, the idea of writing to learn, which is still incredibly valid. Uh, different types of vocab instruction or maybe uh, you have trialled a one-size-fits-all vocab instruction. So. Uh, I know some schools, for example, have gone down Mazzano's path of, of vocab instruction. So he has six steps and, uh, you know, some schools implemented that irrespective of which discipline you're in, you implemented those same six steps. Uh, whereas what we're, what we're shifting to, or what the research is shifting to now is this idea of disciplinary literacy. So if you have a look over on the right, we're really focused on the way that experts in the discipline, how they think, how they speak, how they read and how they write. And really getting our head around how do experts function in those ways and that's, th that's what we need to be teaching our students in those disciplines. So we're looking at the language features and the texts of that specific discipline and the skills that we need to access those texts. And we're looking at discipline specific vocabulary instruction. And we're going to go more into that tonight. So. This quote here comes from the Literacy Teaching Toolkit. It says, disciplinary literacy refers to the learner's ability to read, write, and speak in ways that are valued and used by people in a given discipline. That is, to think like mathematicians, read like historians, and write like scientists. So here, the research has changed to say, actually, we need to, each of the teachers in the discipline is an expert in their own discipline, hopefully. So the, math, the mathematics teachers, they're experts in mathematics. So they are the people that we need to be asking, how do mathematicians uh, read? How do they write? How do they think in their area of expertise? And they're the skills that we need to be teaching our students. So it's not a separate uh, sort of literacy that our maths teachers now need to learn. It's just making our, or getting our maths teachers to be more metacognitive, more conscious of the skills uh, and the understandings that they have around the literacy, how they use literacy in their own discipline. So from the Literacy Teaching Toolkit, uh, these three dot points that I think are really important. Disciplinary literacy recognises that literate strategies 
differ across the disciplines. So it's, and we are going to dive into that one a little bit deeper. Disciplinary literacy means that literate strategies and discipline specific content are intertwined. So when I'm teaching my content, I don't teach my content and then I have to teach all this literacy work over here. It is that I'm trying to teach my content, but I need to build the skills of the students to be able to use literacy strategies to better access that content that I'm trying to deliver. And finally, disciplinary literacy enables students to develop their content knowledge, skills and understanding to become experts within their discipline. So it's actually the literacy is in service of the discipline rather than the other way around. Okay, so let's go into that. Let's have a look at that first dot point a bit more. Reading and writing within mathematics. So starting with reading, okay. Maths is a discipline based on developing understanding through the act of solving problems and the text often utilizes organization, language and syntax that differ substantially from texts in other disciplines. And I don't think anyone would disagree with that. If we give our students a text, say from an English classroom and a maths classroom, those two texts are going to be really different in how, in, in the structure, in the organization, uh, in, in the language. So how do our students access that text that we're giving them in a maths classroom? And in writing, because math language is composed of representation and symbols, there is very little writing in most math classrooms, though there is strong evidence that when students explain their thinking through writing in math classes, they deepen conceptual understandings. So how can we use writing in the maths classroom in service of the content that we're already trying to expose our students to? So there's two quotes that have come from the toolkit around this. Okay, so how do literate strategies differ across the disciplines? Why can't the English teachers teach our students all the strategies that they need to know for all of the disciplines is essentially what we're, what we're wondering here. So firstly, let's have a look at the differences of uh, the types of skills and understandings that our students need to be able to access in order to have success in, say, English and then mathematics. So let's have a look at reading to start off with. So for English, uh, some of the skills, understandings that our students need access to to be successful, uh, finding meaning through literary techniques. So we might, our students might be looking for alliteration. They might be looking for similes or unpacking metaphors, those types of things. They might be identifying themes in text. So we, they might be having a novel and they're look, as they're reading, they're, they're thinking, right, I've got to be identifying the theme of what's going on in this text. Recognising bias summarizing, synthesizing, uh, evaluating what's going on in the text, making connections. So here in the, in the English classroom, we might be talking, the connections that we're talking about might be text to text connections. So uh, I've read this book and it reminds me of this other book that I've read, or it reminds me of this part of a movie. So how does that help me to better understand this story? Uh, there might be text to self connections where you're thinking, oh yeah, I've been through that as well. I'm starting to think that with some of the dystopian novels I've read. Uh, or, you know, those types of connections. They uh, look, they're paying attention to the craft of writing. We're, we're sort of, when we're reading, we're constantly thinking about, in an English class, and we're constantly thinking about, gee, I really like that sentence. You know, that's a really powerful piece. And that's something that we might then later apply to our own writing, that type of thing recognizing elements and then questioning through a critical lens. These are some of the skills and understandings that are in an English classroom, our students need to be successful. Let's flip over to a mathematics classroom now. And we're gonna see that th those skills and understandings are very different. So uh, we need our students to be able to isolate information, to uh, search for information that's needed. So we might be, our students might be uh, posed, they might have a question posed them and they're searching through the text to find what are the key elements here, what are the elements that I'm going to need to solve this problem, which is a different, oh, very different way of reading than when we're reading an English text where we're reading from, you know, top to bottom, left to right, and we're reading every single word on the page or it might uh, compromise our understanding of the text. The, in a mathematics classroom, our students might be identifying patterns and relationships but they're different relationships to the ones that we're identifying in an English classroom. It's, we're not talking about friend, who's friends with who and you know, that, that type of thing. Uh, deciphering symbols and abstract ideas. Symbols, 
we do, we, of course our students might come across symbols in an English classroom, but the symbols that we're talking about in a mathematics classroom are really different and they have, they could be the key to a whole lot of other information that our students need to access in order to be successful in, that, in the reading. Uh, applying reasoning and number sense, seeking accuracy, very important in a maths classroom, that idea of accuracy. Analyzing, formulating and interpreting uh, evaluating data and considering the vocab and word parts specific to maths. So you can see there's some really different skill sets and we're just, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the mode of reading, uh, but it's very different in an English classroom as it is to a maths or the, the, the discipline of maths. Let's have a look at writing. So in an English classroom for writing, uh, our students might be, they might be using the writing process. They might start with drafting. You know, we take them through revising and editing and publishing and that type of approach. Uh, we, our students, we want them to flexibly use organisations so that we're not, we're not all creating a, a cookie cutter piece. You know, if we're writing a persuasive text, we don't want everyone to start with first, then and next. Uh, otherwise, the poor audience reading will be bored out of their brain. Uh, so. Uh, we need to teach our students in the English classroom the structure so that we can break the structure or so that we can uh, adapt it, modify it, always with the intention of keeping our reader engaged. Uh, that's very different to the writing that we're doing in a maths classroom. So we're employing literary devices. They're the ones that we've, that we've observed in our reading. So we're, you know, we're, employ we're starting to write similes or alliteration or metaphor in our own writing. We're not doing that in a maths class. We're not, uh, you know, having a, a, a writing out a maths problem with an alliteration as the starting as the starting focus. We're using evidence. We're using mentor text. So mentor text is when we have another text that we craft off. So uh, an example, I think that all teachers can identify a mentor text when we're applying for another teaching job or a, you know maybe a leadership position. The first thing we do is say hey, has anyone else got uh, some examples of this so I can read them and, and sort of get an idea for what this needs to look like. So well, we might use mentor text in a, in a different way in the, in the maths classroom we, to craft off. We uh, would probably use them more in an English classroom. And we're adapting our communication for various audiences in an English classroom because we're always thinking about audience uh, and how to keep them engaged, whereas in the maths classroom for writing, we're thinking about exactness and precise language. So we're not going to necessarily change our language to suit the audience because that's not the purpose of the writing that we're doing in that classroom or in that setting. So in maths, we're looking at explaining, we're looking at justifying, describing, estimating, analyzing. Even those words themselves need to be unpacked. What does it mean? What does it look like? Uh, we're using representations. We're seeking precision. We're using real world situations where possible. So uh, we're all about communi communicating ideas clearly. That's why we're not using similes and metaphors in our maths problems. Uh, we're about drawing conclusions, using symbols and knowing and un really understanding what they mean uh, and including reasons and examples. So it's, you can see here, uh, if we think about this, on the left, we've got the, the, the I guess the requirements in, a, in, a, in an English classroom. On the right, we've got the requirements for a mathematics classroom. We've then got a science classroom. We've got a health and PE classroom. We've got an art classroom. And each of these disciplines has have strategies that differ. So that's why we can't be leaving this to the English teacher to be teaching all of the strategies required across each of the disciplines. And uh, you can see, say, for example, in the maths classroom, if we, as the maths experts, are teaching our, our students the skills that we use, we are the ex we know what we're talking about. We are the content experts in the mathematics classroom. So we're in the best position to expose our students to these skills and strategies. Okay, I'm going to ask you to, I want to know your thoughts. If you had to name the most important literacy related skills students need in mathematics, what would it be? Hmm. This is a tough one because obviously I've just outlined a whole bunch of uh, different literacy related skills that our students need. What do you think uh, is the number one most important literacy skill uh, that students need in the mathematics classroom? I would love to know your thoughts on this. Pop them in the chat. I'll be having a look in a minute. Uh, but it's, I think this is, 
might be the first time that we've been able to stop and think about this. Uh, so, and I guess one way of thinking about this is if your students are really struggling to access some of the content that you've been trying to teach, which literacy related skills are they struggling with or might they be struggling with that's that you know is is preventing them from accessing that content so maybe it's uh, i see someone suggested syntax maybe it's the vocabulary maybe it is the decoding strategies or that their ability to infer i would love to know what your you're the you are the content experts and uh, you see what's happening with your students every day so have a think about this put your ideas in the chat we might come back to those. The thing that we need to understand about all of this is that we can't expect our students to just automatically have these skills. So I always go back to this idea of the gradual release of responsibility. This is uh, Fisher and Fry's adaptation of Pearson and Gallagher's original work, or Pearson's original work. I think it was around 1985 he developed this. Uh, and Nancy Fisher and Douglas Fry have modified this to include the coll collaborative phase. So this gradual release of responsibility is that idea that it is the teacher who takes most of the responsibility for the learning in the first place on the left-hand side, and we slowly slide over to the students taking the full responsibility. So what does this look like? Okay, so in, what this looks like is that if we want our students to have the ability to do all of these things that you're now listing in the chat as uh, really important literacy skills, then we've got to ask ourselves, how have we built the capacity of our students to be able to do those things that we're listing? So say, uh, for example, I see someone has said, identifying key information within a worded problem. So as a teacher, I, I think this is a brilliant framework to say, okay, my kids are really struggling with identifying key information in a worded problem. Let's pull out the gradual release and let's do a self-reflection to say, what can I do to take the responsibility for that and slowly hand it over to the students? So that is in the top section there, the focused instruction or the focus lesson. That's I do it. I'm going to model this for my students. Now, I think... I've, I've been thinking about this recently. I think the word modelled might be confusing some people. It's not as clear as I want it to be. So I think if you think about demonstrate, this the, the top section here in the gradual release of responsibility, this is the teacher demonstrating a proficient user of mathematics and literacy, uh, demonstrating this skill for the students. We're not asking for, the, for any uh, students to you know, call out or to give us suggestions about how they might do it. Here, it is me demonstrating the skill for the students. And when I'm demonstrating it, I'm using a think aloud. So whatever's coming into my head within reason, of course, uh, I am saying that stuff out loud. So, you know, I'm saying, okay, I'm in this question, I've been asked to do this. So the first thing I'm thinking that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to the start and I'm gonna reread the question and then I'm gonna look for keywords. So I'm gonna, these, this is how I'm gonna work out what the keywords might be. I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna reread to see if I can find those keywords. So this is me at the front of the classroom demonstrating and doing a think aloud at the same time, which is an incredibly powerful uh, teaching strategy and really undervalued in schools. So if you want more information on the think aloud strategy, you can Google that. It's in the Literacy Teaching Toolkit Primary. There's a whole section on it. And there's also some think aloud strategy in the English Toolkit. So you just uh, Google it and you'll get more information. Then we're moving down to We Do It, which is guided instruction. So this is when we might, the students might be having a go at it, but we as a teacher are still uh, present and we're, and we're you know, chipping in and giving them some suggestions and some practice at it. Before we get all the way down to the bottom to You Do It Alone, which is independent practice. Uh, and sometimes due to time constraints and you know curriculum creep and crowded curriculum, all of those things, we go straight down to this You Do It Alone. So I'm going to give you a task and then you're just going to go off and do it alone. So we've got to think about if, we're, if our kids are struggling with these literacy skills, pull out the gradual release and think about bringing back that scaffold to say, I need to do it first, then we can do it together before I'm going to release you off to do it by yourselves. So uh, this, I'm a huge fan of gradual release for everything that we do in explicit in teaching. Okay, So keep that in your mind. Uh, the gradual release is also basically how the literacy teaching toolkit mathematics is structured. So the first half of it is really focused on the teacher responsibility, and then the second half of it is really handing it over to the students so that for that student responsibility. But we're going to have a bit more of a look at that in a minute. 
Okay, given you a lot of information, guys, that is the introduction to the disciplinary literacy or the concept of disciplinary literacy and how it applies to the mathematics classroom. In the activity pack that was supplied to you either via email or through the link on Padlet, I now want you to, I'm gonna give you three uh, minutes of an oasis of time where you can just do a reflection to think about your knowledge around disciplinary literacy and how that applies to the mathematics classroom. So uh, I just, it's activity two in your uh, booklet. What did you agree with around discipline, disciplinary literacy? That is such a mouthful to say really quickly. Uh, what is the most important thing that you learned and what questions do you still have? So, and I would love to see some of your thinking in the chat. So I'm gonna start the timer and I'll be back in three minutes. Okay, I'd love to see some of your thinking in the chat about that. Just, I've noticed that some of you haven't actually managed to get onto the chat yet. So if you see the, uh, the address down the bottom of the screen, uh, just type that into another tab and then you can join in the conversation on the back channel. So you can access, just make sure that you've got access to the, to the uh, booklet that we sent out, the supporting resources pack, because we're going to do an activity soon that requires it. Okay. Let's go into section two for the night. So this is, we're going to now look at exploring the literacy teaching toolkit mathematics, okay? Uh, this, it is a hard way to, to, to model for people, the literacy teaching toolkit mathematics to do it in this format, uh, because you know there's nothing more boring than me standing out the front saying, click this, now click this, but I'm gonna do my best. I, my intention in this is really to give you an overview so you know what's there 
so that you can go and explore it in your own time later on. I'm not going to show you what's on every single page. No one needs to see that, but I am going to give you an overview and help you to understand you know, where you can go for different things in the toolkit. Okay, so firstly, I am just going to explain what the toolkit is because I understand that some of you may not have accessed this yet and I think the, Basto, the team from the department have actually put out a question there to ask if anyone's, if you've been on the, on the toolkit already. So if you're brand new to it, welcome. What a great resource it is. Uh, basically, it is an online resource that is available 24 seven. Uh, it builds positively, positive literacy cultures in schools. Uh, it's focused on improving student literacy outcomes, developing student content knowledge in each of the curriculum areas. So it's not so much about um, focus on, on developing their literacy knowledge, it's about we want to help maths teachers to get students to access the content in their area. And it enhances differentiation. So it builds our content knowledge as teachers to know how to better support the students in our class. What's included, uh, each, of the tool, each of the disciplines is, has its own uh, different parts, I guess you could say. So there are expert videos uh, in, in most of the disciplines and more of those will be put up as time goes along. In-class videos, and I'm so excited to say they're Victorian videos. How exciting is that to have access high quality videos to Victorian classrooms. I think that is so exciting for us. Uh, curriculum specific resources and strategies, evidence-based literacy teaching advice. And I think this is really exciting for Victorian teachers as well to have that we now have really strong direction uh, and we're all going in the same direction. So this toolkit is really the anchor for us and, and the literacy learning across our state. And it has the latest research in pedagogy and it sort of saves us from doing all the work. So, you know, trying to go out and read all the different research. We can trust that the experts who put the kit together have done that for us and they're putting it out there, easy access. So it's the toolkit is available on the department's website. I personally just Google literacy teaching toolkit and I think that's the easiest way to find it. There's probably a more department savvy way of finding it, but that works for me. So that's what I'm recommending. Now, there is a, the Literacy Teaching Toolkit, there's a primary version and a seven to 10 version. If you find yourself, maybe you're a Mylands teacher and you're, you've, you're working with some students who are, uh, have low literacy or low maths knowledge, I really recommend that you go and have a look at the primary kit because there are some really strong teaching practices in there. And I know that a lot of Mylands teachers have found themselves in a position where they need to uh, upskill in terms of uh, teaching, reading, to, or learning to re students how to, how to read rather than uh, reading to learn. So I definitely recommend having a look at the primary toolkit. And then of course, here we are, we've got the secondary toolkit. Now, the difference between the two toolkits is that in the primary version, it's split into the modes. So everything you wanna know about reading is in one section, everything you wanna know about writing is in another section. Obviously that's really challenging in a secondary environment where the, now that we're talking about this idea of disciplinary literacy and those literate practices and strategies differing in the disciplines. So in, as you can see on this screen, in the secondary toolkit, it is separated via discipline. Okay, so we've already looked at, we've already had a webinar to introduce people to the science, the science toolkit or the literacy teaching toolkit science. We've already talked about literacy toolkit English. And then here we are tonight, literacy toolkit mathematics. So as you can see on the screen, humanities, arts, technology, health and PE are coming. You have, they have not been forgotten. We, it just takes time to get all of the experts to come together and pull out the best resources uh, and to create the videos. So definitely coming, all right? So let's dive into this literacy in mathematics. The, this is the homepage of the literacy in mathematics. I've obviously, I've snipped it, so it's not everything. And I've put a red border around it just so that when I'm demonstrating and taking us through the different pages, you'll know when we've come back to this main page. It's got a nice big thick red border around it. So the toolkit is all of, each of the disciplines are structured in a really similar way. So basically we have an introduction. You can see there we've got an introduction to literacy in mathematics. We have a section called developing understanding in you know, whichever discipline we're talking about. We have a section called communicating understanding in whichever section we're talking, discipline we're talking about. 
And then we have a, a section called putting it all together. So sort of we introduce that idea of literacy and the discipline. The developing understanding is really, go back to that gradual release of responsibility. This is really the teacher, uh, heavy on the teacher responsibility side. So this is more when we're delivering the content. And then that communicating understanding, this is when we're really further on, we're down the, the track and we're heavy on that student responsibility side. And we're expecting our students to demonstrate their understanding about what they've learned during the topic that we've, that we've been talking to them about. And it's like a little present. We tie it all off with a bow. Uh, that putting it all together gives us examples of how all of, this, all of these literacy strategies can look in a unit of work. So we are going to have a look at each of these sections. Let's go to the first one. So in the first one, introduction to literacy and mathematics, and this is really similar for each of the disciplines. So if you're a literacy leader in your school, you, you might have seen this in the science and the English one, very similar. So in the maths one, we've got mathematical literacy and literacy in maths, so that it's really clarifying what is it, what, what's the difference between mathematical literacy and then literacy in maths. The literate demands in, math, math, in mathematics education. So what do our kids need to know in a maths classroom around literacy? And then we look at the Victorian curriculum. So what's the literacy in the Victorian curriculum for maths? Okay, that's the overview. Now, in uh, the toolkit, mathematical literacy is defined in this way. I'm going to read it out to you. An individual's capacity to formulate, employ, and interpret mathematics in a variety of contexts. It includes reasoning mathematically and using mathematical concepts, procedures, facts, and tools to describe, explain, and predict phenomena. It assists individuals to recognize the role that mathematics plays in the world and to make the well-founded judgments and decisions needed by constructive, engaged, and reflective citizens. What I really love about this is that we're talking big picture. Why is maths even important? We're going beyond, you know, why these every second question on the left-hand side, why is that important? We're talking about where does maths sit in the world? Okay, so the literacy in maths, according to the toolkit, improving students' literacy in mathematics will help them to build connections between terminology, concepts, skills and representations, contributing to the development of mathematical literacy. So they're saying that the literacy, if we give our skill, if we skill our students up in the, in the literacy required in the maths classroom, they're going to have more access to mathematical literacy, the, you know, what's in, in the first box there. So the ability to develop understanding and communicate mathematics requires students to be able to understand and correctly use notation, subject-specific language, uh, conventions and representation. I'll see some of you have uh, sort of alluded to those in the chat where you've talked about the skills that our kids need. Okay, so we go back to the main page and we're going to look at developing understanding of math. So this is where our students are in that phase, mainly where we're teaching and we're uh, delivering content to them. Uh, and it's really, this is where the students are really learning new knowledge in, in our maths classes, okay? So we're at the learning new knowledge part of the cycle. So in this, there are two sections. One is learning mathematical language. And, and I noticed someone in the chat has said that the vocabulary is an issue for students. And the second is using literacy to support problem solving, okay? So let's have a look first at that using mathematical language. We're only going to do a light touch look on it at the moment because later on we're going to go a bit deeper into the vocabulary in the maths classroom. So these are the, these are the links, strategies to develop an understanding of maths language. We've got translating from words to symbols. We've got understanding terms and notations. We've got everyday versus mathematical language, uh, technological terminology. So each of these are links to other pages with resources, uh, to, to research, all of those types of things. So there's all of these can be expanded and you can get extra information on each of these little subheadings. There's a lot of information in here uh, and it'd be really useful for you in your own time to go and have a look at, at and, and see what's on each of these pages. All right, let's go back to that. Let's have a look at the second one, using literacy to support problem solving. So what are the resources available to maths teachers in terms of using literacy to support problem solving? And again, 
This is helping us to teach our content. So it's not something that's separate. So here we've got uh, information about close reading, which I strongly recommend. There's a huge, uh, Hattie's effect sizes really uh, indicate this is a very effective te teaching technique. Identifying a simpler related problem, drawing a diagram, using an organized list, all of these types of things. I am just going to, to, to dive into one of these just to show you what some of the resources could look like. So identifying a simpler related problem. So if we click on that, what does it look like? What are we provided with? Glad you asked. <laughs> all right, so first of all, you get an overview. And this is, so this, each of the uh, strategies here, when you click on them, you're gonna get a similar layout. So usually you're going to have, start with an overview to tell, you, to tell you what this strategy is. So here, identifying a simpler related problem so it says, and it gives you a little bit of an overview. Uh, I'm going to, I will read this out to you because it relates to, I'm going to unpack it so you can see how it looks. To solve a complex problem, it can be helpful to consider a simpler related problem. This can help students to identify the structure of a method for solving, which can then be used to solve the original problem. In order for students to do this, they must in, uh, interpret the worded problem, which some of you have said is the problem, is an issue and identify a simpler problem that is relevant to help them solve the given, given problem. So we've got an overview of what this strategy is. The next thing is they have a section called understanding the strategy. So this is about building teacher content knowledge so that you can teach this strategy. So it says to model this strategy, teachers should, and then it gives you uh, five suggestions here or five steps here for how you can model, go back to that gradual release of responsibility, how you can model this using this strategy to students, okay? So that's the next section. Then we have an example, and this is the same, and all of the strategies have this. So they have the overview, they have understanding the strategy, and, and then they have an example. And I see someone just asked for an example in the chat. Well, here you go. So the, the example that they've used here is a year eight example, and they have different uh, year levels for each of them. So the problem they've demonstrated, there are 20 people at a party and they each shake hands once. Well, obviously not, a, um, not happening at the moment. Chose a really bad example. How many handshakes will there be on a, at, a, at a normal time, that is, not at the current time? <laughs> All right, so then you go into teacher actions. So teacher presents problem and leads a discussion about how students might identify a similar uh, related problem, a simpler related problem. So we, because we're teaching the kids this strategy, yeah, that, they're gonna, that they could apply to any maths problem they come up against. To solve this more complex problem. Discussion questions. So it even provides the questions that we as teachers can ask our students to introduce this strategy. Uh, how might finding the number of handshakes for four people help in finding the number of handshakes for 20 people? And then it goes into student actions. So uh, they, they might act it out, they might, draw, they might draw a diagram, they might make a list, et cetera. So we've got the introduction, we've got understanding the strategy, and then we've got an example. And this is the second part of the example. So then we're provided with scaffolded, uh, scaffolding and discussion. So this helps us to know what's some of the discussion that we can start or, or lead with our students around this strategy. So the teacher prompts students for their reasoning, and here are some questions. Um, what strategy did you use? How can you use your approach for working out the number of handshakes for four people to determine the number of handshakes for 20 people, et cetera? Uh, and then usually we'll also have a solution, or often we'll have a solution uh, to, the, to the strategy as well. Okay, so for this particular problem, actually if you go into, so we've looked at identifying a simpler related problem, and if you go into the next one, which is drawing a diagram, this the example is actually relevant to that, that same problem. So I'm going to just show you that as well. So again, we've got the overview. So what is this, this strategy of drawing a diagram? What is it? So they can draw a diagram. It can support students to represent a situation. Great. Uh, understanding the strategy. So it gives us steps to how we can implement this strategy, how we can teach students the strategy of drawing a diagram. Then we go into the examples. So we're looking at the same structure again. And for this, they're actually using the same problem, which is really handy. And you can see the diagram was drawn by year eight students solving the handshake problem. The teacher asked the student to draw the diagram on the board and explain how she used it to solve the problem. Uh, and then the second part of the 
uh, then we then we're provided with solution. So this is the the solution that the student came up with and the transcript of how they explained it to the rest of the class. So I think there's some really useful resources on here. And sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes some of these are the things that we used to do and then we forgot, you know, we, we've forgotten to do them or that they've just slipped out of our practice. So I think it's really good to have, uh, just to have this toolkit as a reminder of, oh yeah, I used to do that. Actually, I need to bring that back into my practice. You know, we've, we're really busy now. We've got lots of different things coming at us and sometimes some of our practices slip away. So I think uh, using this toolkit to just re refresh our brain about some of those really effective practices we used to do is, is great. Okay, back to the uh, main page again now. So the, we've had a look at the introduction to literacy and mathematics. We've had a look at developing understanding in mathematics. Now we're going to shift over to, so in the first, that developing understanding, that was when the students were building their knowledge. And now we're going to shift over to, we want to see what have the students learnt in mathematics. So what are the outputs, okay? Uh, let's have a look once they've built their understanding. So again, we've got two sections that we can go into here, creating visual representations and supporting solutions. So we're going to look at the first one, creating visual representations. So just a little overview at the top there. In math, students can be encouraged to create a range of visual text to support their thinking, reasoning, and communicating. And this relates to modal affordance. So that idea of modal affordance is that, you know, the opportunities and limitations that different modes of communication offer. So sometimes we might want our students to orally justify their uh, reasoning. Sometimes we might want them to write it, that type of thing. So here we've got uh, converting written questions into graphical representations. We've got discussing and critiquing graphical representations. And I think particularly for student talk, so that idea of uh, discussing and crit critiquing, for some reason uh, we throw that gradual release of responsibility completely out the window and we assume that our kids know how to discuss and critique how to have those deep substantive conversations. So we've got to pull that gradual release of responsibility back in and say, have we explicitly taught our students the skills that they need to be able to discuss effectively uh, and critique the work that we're talking about? And often we haven't, we just make that assumption that they know. All right, so we've got creating tables, jointly constructing concept maps and creating and presenting statistical displays. I am going to zoom in on this jointly constructing concept maps as a way of students demonstrating their knowledge on a topic. And I think there's some real links here to formative assessment. So when the students are engaging in these things, this is great information for us as teachers to know how much of the learning they're taking on, okay? So uh, let's have a look. Jointly constructing concept maps. You'll see this is structured in the same way that, we, that the other problems were, where they have an introduction, uh, and then we've got an understanding of the strategy, and then an example. Uh, so let's have a look. So here, there's an, under, there's an introduction to what are concept maps and why might they be useful in the mathematics classroom. Then we've got understanding the strategy. So again, it's going to provide us with the ways that we as the teacher can introduce this strategy to our students. And then we've got extra steps here. So this is a year nine trigonometry example. Uh, and it's all, of course, linked to the Victorian curriculum, the example. So even using the problems from here would be really useful. So this is step-by-step -step instructions for us on how it might look in a lesson. And I guess the idea here is to build our content knowledge around and our pedagogical knowledge around well, this is the example they've provided and now how might I adapt this to teach the concept that I'm trying to teach in year 10 maths or in year seven maths or for a different, uh, for a different topic. So thinking about, okay, well, that's their example. How can I apply that or adapt it to whatever it is that I'm teaching, okay? And they've got an example here. So uh, stepping them through, ask students to list all the key areas for trigonometry then ask them to share key ideas in a class discussion. And again, we need to build their knowledge around how to have that effective discussion. Ask students to draw arrows between related key ideas. Ask students to add text or examples to show what they've learned about the connection between the ideas. 
and then ask pairs of students to discuss their concept maps and compare the key ideas. And if you actually, if you put that this uh, example next to the gradual release of responsibility, you'll see that each of the layers there is really looked at. So that they've, they've provided an example of teacher demonstration, they've provided an example of collaborative work where students are working with others, and they've provided an uh, example of independent work. Okay, and yep, this, the other section in that communicating understanding is supporting solutions. So in here, uh, it's, we're really wanting our students to explain their reasoning and provide justification for their answers. So this, this really links to that opening, the quote that I shared at the start about talk, because learning how to think, uh, we're really talking about talking your way into meaning. So we've got to bring that into our classroom. Implementing strategies that support students to express and justify their solutions enables students to better demonstrate their mathematical reasoning. So it's not necessarily about, you know, can everyone get the right answer into the air? It's about that discussion because that really helps us to build clarity about how these concepts are related. Uh, so students will benefit from more discussion of alternative solutions and more opportunity to explain their thinking. And there's some examples on the toolkit about providing students with incorrect responses and, then ha and having them engage in a discussion about why they're incorrect. So we're really looking at that reasoning and justification. So here we're looking at critiquing and questioning solutions and again, all of the resources you need to introduce that to students. Recognising appropriate answers justification of solutions, and communicating solutions uh, where technology is used. Yes, mention of technology, great. And back to the main page, you can see there is a lot in here and it really needs you to have some time to go through and just basically click on every link and see what's in there and what's going to be most useful in which order for you in your class and for your instruction. The final section I said before that putting it all together puts a little bow on the top, just ties it all nicely. Uh, so this is really about, and this follows the same pattern to the other disciplines. So here um, we're really looking at writing solutions to worded mathematical problems and learning sequences, which will be added. They're not on there just yet. So here they, they provide, or in the toolkit it provides uh, an overview of what some of these literate practices could look like across a unit of work. I absolutely recommend having a look at this. And even uh, sort of gives you an idea about when you might introduce different literate strategies. So when, when might you use the developing understanding strategies? When might you use, use the communicating understanding strategies? So there's some really good examples in here. Um, the, it actually goes, this one's, they've got a, the example in here is a year nine example. Uh, students are going to a school fate or they're having a school fate. There's been a donation of 10 kilos of flour uh, and then they want the students to make uh, so many batches of muffins. And so the, it follows how you would introduce that to students, the literate, literate strategies they would need to be able to unpack the problem and to work out the solution. So it's, yeah, there's some really good resources on there. Wow, that is the whirlwind tour of the Literacy Teaching Toolkit Mathematics. Uh, so we've got the introduction, developing understanding, communicating understanding, and then putting it all together. There, real in the maths toolkit, there is a there is a lot, and there's some really brilliant resources and some some really strong scaffolding for mathematics teachers. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you three minutes just to process some of that and think about, you know, what which parts of that really interest you? Where do you think you might be spending your time if you happen to have some free time coming up? Where might you spend your time looking on the toolkit? Uh, what do you think is going to, going to be of most use for you? So I'm going to give you three minutes and then we're going to dive into the, uh, the vocabulary. All right, let's have a look at this.
Okay. Three minutes. Very quick time, isn't it? So you can see the toolkit, it is enormous. There are so many different aspects to it. I can I see someone's asked for a toolkit in hard copy. Um, unfortunately, that is not available at the moment because it, because of the size of it. I think it would be absolutely enormous if we were to print it. Not to say that you can't print it. Uh, you, you totally could do that. But uh, there, to, it's always being updated. Different things are being added. Uh, hopefully, some videos will be added. So there's lots of different resources that are... It's not a sort of this is the finished product and it's never to be touched again. It's going to be something that's continually added to. So. Uh, we'd have to be reprinting it all the time, I guess. Uh, but absolutely, if you want to print off some of the resources from there, I don't think that you should uh, not do that. All right, we are going to dive into the vocabulary instruction. Uh, this I selected to do out of all the things that we could look at in depth, I wanted to look at one section of the toolkit in depth and that's because uh, I don't think it's in anybody's best interest for me to be standing here and saying, well, and then there's this page, and then there's this page, and then there's this page. I think the best way, now that you've got an overview of what's available to you on the toolkit, the best way for you to really learn about it is to go and spend some time looking at all of the different sections. But I did want to go through in depth, in more detail, just one section so that you've got something practical that you can take away after today's session. All right, so the reason that I've selected vocabulary is because the research around this is so strong about the impact, the dividends that, and it's, it, it's an investment that pays big dividends in student learning and really gives our students great access to the content knowledge that we are trying to teach them, particularly in the mathematics classroom. So there's a lot of research around this and we're gonna have a look at some of the research. Uh, I also want to, to point out vocabulary because I think some of the people coming to tonight's webinars will be literacy specialists and you might be uh, tasked with the job of you know, building all of the teachers that, or building literacy into all of the disciplines across your school. And I think vocabulary is a really terrific starting place for helping discipline really, or discipline teachers or teachers of dis different disciplines to uh, come on board with the understanding of how disciplinary literacy Im improves or impact positively impacts the teaching of their content area. Because um, once teachers can see the dividends that it pays, then they'll be more receptive to the other areas of the toolkit, okay? All right, so firstly, let's see what the toolkit has to say about the place of vocabulary in the discipline of mathematics. So it says here, I'm just gonna read from this. Like all discipline areas, mathematics has specific language that students must understand in order to make meaning and develop knowledge. Being able to interpret language in a range of mathematical contexts and for different purposes is fundamental to mathematical problem solving. Okay, so uh, there are Fleming and Jizzy describe three types of vocabulary that students need to be able to solve worded problems. Mathematics vocabulary, that's not a surprise to any of us. Procedural vocabulary and descriptive vocabulary. And the toolkit is suggesting that each type of vocabulary needs to be explicitly taught and that their use needs to be modeled to students. Going back to that gradual release again. So, uh, Let's see what, the res what other research has to say about this. So firstly, uh, the top one, knowledge of mathematics vocabulary affects student achievement, particularly in the areas of problem solving. And I see some of you have uh, suggested that problem solving is the area that your students really struggle with. Reasoning and communicating about mathematics, okay? Re research, this one I find absolutely staggering and I think it really builds a strong case for why vocabulary instruction is so critical in the maths classroom. Research by Gifford and Gore showed that underperforming math students who received vocabulary instruction showed standardised test gain as high as 93%. So we're talking about really high impact teaching here that with explicit vocabulary instruction, okay? Vocabulary knowledge is content knowledge. It's not something that's separate. 
So when our, and we're going to talk about what is that vocabulary knowledge, look, what does it look like in the mathematics classroom? So again, these, uh, these sort of issues are exacerbated for any emerging bilingual students or EAL students, some people refer to them as. So maths is a language, and in the same way that we need to explicitly teach our emerging bilingual students English, we need to be teaching all of our students the language of mathematics. Okay, so uh, when we're talking about standardized tests, what's, what is the link to vocabulary there? And I think, you know, everyone's uh, thinking about standardized tests at this time of the year. So I thought I'd raise it. Uh, on the Birth to Level 10 Numeracy Guide, um, there's a link to the vocabulary section on there. If you're a mathematics teacher and you haven't checked out the Birth to Level 10 Numeracy Guide yet, it is amazing. That is also, that's a resource that's been created by the department to support you in your work as well. There's a link on there when we're talking about vocabulary to the work of Dr. Paul Swan, an Australian, which is also lovely to have an Australian's uh, resources. And uh, he has listed on his website, he's actually gone back through some of the previous NAPLAN assessments for mathematics, and he's looked at the vocabulary requirements for the questions on the, on the NAPLAN assessments. So this is an example of the year five NAPLAN, uh, the questions that he's looked at for 2018. Now, uh, you can see here, for example, question one, talking about coins, the written literacy, greatest value. So obviously our students need to understand what does greatest mean, what does value mean? Uh, kitchen sink holds about the same amount as, what does that mean? Altogether subtraction sentence. These examples on his website, unfortunately, they're only, he only uh, analyzes the primary NAPLAN, mathematics NAPLAN, but I absolutely would strongly recommend that if you're a mathematics teacher, then you, with your team of maths teachers, pull out some of the previous NAPLAN assessments and let's look at the vocabulary requirements. And if we uh, think about, so I've actually had a little go at this. So I, uh, I only had access to the 2016 NAPLAN, Maths NAPLAN. But what I've done here is I've looked at some of the questions I have looked at. So before we just said there were three uh, types of vocabulary that students need access to, the mathematics, procedural and descriptive. And I've had a look at some of the questions and really ask myself, well, what is the mathematical vocabulary? What's the procedural vocabulary? And what's the descriptive vocabulary our students need access to to have success with these questions? Okay, so I've crafted off Dr. S off Dr. Swan's work here. He's been my mentor text, if you like. Uh, so let's just have a look. So question six on that now plan on the year seven for 2016, it was a worded problem and the, the maths language students needed access to units and mass. If our students don't know what units are uh, and which unit are we talking about, you know, there's a, there's a colloquial term, a unit, uh, which is, a, I guess, a, a, a derogatory term for a type of person. Uh, mass, which mass are we talking about? Then question nine, they need to know graph and key as, as they uh, relate to mathematics. Question 12, square numbers, sum, multiply, divided, difference. Then we get down to question 24. It was a visual uh, problem. They need to know triangle, position, transformations, clockwise, origin, uh, x-axis, translate, units. Like, you know, the, the vocabulary required here is starting to really bump up and our kids need to have access to this. Otherwise, they're gonna have no way of accessing the actual problem. So then we've got the procedural language. Our students need to understand words like statement. Uh, and which statement are we talking about there? Nearest or resulted. And in descriptive, they need to know, have access to words like accurate, commercial vehicles, true, four units down, four units left, as they apply in those contexts, okay? So uh, I think that doing this can really help us to see how explicit we need to be when we're teaching vocabulary for different concepts. So I'm going to take one of those questions. Let's take the, uh, the final one there. This is the actual question as it appears on the NAPLAN. Uh, it's a year seven question. So it says triangle ABC is moved to the new position shown by triangle EFG. Which of these transformations resulted in the new position? Rotate ABC 180 degrees clockwise about the origin. 
So what does that mean about the origin? And do we use this technical vocab when we're, in, when we're talking to our students about these types of problems in our classroom? Are we using this, this technical vocabulary? And when our students are giving their answers in class, so if we're talking about or unpacking this as a class, are we requesting of our students, do we have high expectations to say, this is the language I'm expecting you to use in your response? So uh, we want our students to, to use complete sentences and we want them to use this language about the origin. Rotate clockwise about the origin. Reflect across the x-axis. Translate four units left. So we've got, we need to be really explicit about this and not accept less precise language from our students. But again, we have to model this for our students. We've got to go back to that gradual release of responsibility. So think about here, we're not just thinking about the question, but we're actually thinking about what are the language needs required to even understand what the question's asking of us? You know, what's, what's the knowledge of symbols and notation that our students need to understand? Have we been through that gradual release of responsibility to get them to a point where they can have these understandings? Okay, so I, I think this absolutely, I think it would be a really useful uh, activity, maybe in a PLC even, is to pull out previous NAPLAN assessment and let's just look at it for the vocabulary requirements. And then let's see where is that, where is that explicit instruction happening in our classrooms. So why, sh why else, if I haven't already convinced you, I'm building my persuasive argument here, why else do we need to teach vocabulary? You know, because it does take time to teach vocabulary. So uh, why else should I be, be prioritising some time in my maths classroom for vocabulary? Firstly, language is not only a tool for communication, but a tool for thinking. Every maths teacher is a language teacher, particularly the academic language used to formulate and communicate mathematics learning. There is no teacher more qualified to teach the language of mathematics than the mathematics teachers themselves. These two quotes here I really think something worthy of thinking about and they're, all, they're specific to the maths classroom. Maths language is concise. There are no wasted or superfluous words. This, that is so different to the English classroom. In the English classroom, we are, you know, sometimes we're rewarded for sort of being a bit flowery about our language. There's no flowery in maths. It is very concise. Uh, and this is, this is what we need to expect from our students. When, when they're providing an answer, we need them to be concise and precise. Research has shown that maths texts contain more concepts per sentence and paragraph than any other type of text. So if, if that hasn't convinced you that, or if nothing I've said before has convinced you that vocabulary instruction is really critical in a maths classroom, research has shown that maths texts contain more concepts per sentence and paragraph than any other type of text. So we've got to give our kids the skills to be able to access those concepts. Otherwise, it's for nothing. And then again, we've got that other layer of how do our EAL students uh, work within this? What are the supports that we're giving to our emerging bilingual students? Okay. All right. Okay, that's fine. I get it. We're going to teach vocabulary. It's really important. How? How am I going to do that? Well, of course, we're going to go and look at the toolkit and see whether the resources and supports available on there for us. Uh, but I just want to pr provide you with these three considerations for whichever approach you take to teaching vocabulary to your math students. The first is that we have to choose which words we're going to teach. So it's not sort of just a matter of, uh, you know, woo, we're doing this problem, so, you know, let's just choose this word and now I'm going to do this big explicit session on this word. We have to think in advance and we have to plan for this vocabulary instruction. So if I've got a topic coming up on trigonometry, you know, in the next two weeks, I need to think now, what are the words that my students are going to need access to to be really successful with this content? And I'm going to plan to t explicitly teach that vocabulary. So I might have uh, up on the board, I might have these are some of the words that you're going to come across in this unit. Uh, I might bring that back. So I've seen, and I know some people change classrooms in the secondary classroom. I've some people uh, use a coat hanger and they have a, uh, an anchor chart, so a poster that they've created, 
and they peg it onto their, their code hanger and they bring that in every class and stick it back up there. That's our anchor chart for vocab instruction. The second dot point, students should have between seven to 15 exposures of each new word. This means that we can't just explain it at the start of the topic and that means our kids have understood it and they've got it and they'll be able to use it ever after. So seven to 15 exposures, what are the implications for teaching then? You know, we have to keep drawing our students' attention back to these words. So if we're teaching our trigonometry unit, then the, remember, this is the vocab, let's go over this, let's do a turn and talk, what's, what do you know about this word now? Okay, what's your knowledge of this? Seven to 15 exposures. And the final dot point, the, the words, the vocabulary that we're talking about need to be read, heard, spoken, and written. So it's, we're not just doing a definition, writing a definition here from the board. We have to read them, we have to hear them, we have to speak them, and we have to write them. We've got to roll those words around on our own tongues as students. We've got to practice using them. So when we're, asked, when we're getting responses back from students, we want them to be using the words that we've said are, are really important in this unit, okay? Thinking about those, let's go back to the toolkit and see what are the resources uh, that can help us to, now that we know all of this information about why we should teach vocab and some of these dot points about the things that, are that we should consider. Back on the developing understanding in mathematics, we can go into learning mathematical language and we have a whole bunch of resources for introducing new vocabulary to students, okay? So uh, we're just gonna explore a couple of options under the introducing new mathematical terminology. So what, how might we do this? What are the supports and strategies for teachers for this? So let's have a look at this one. Introducing new mathematical terminology. What, does the, what are the supports that the toolkit provides around this? The other thing we're gonna look at that concept of everyday versus mathematical language, because this is uh, one of the, I guess, the tricky parts, particularly maths. Uh, this idea of polysemy or words having multiple meanings, it seems to come up a lot in, in the area of mathematics. So firstly, joint construction of terminology is one of the areas on the toolkit. Uh, and this can involve teachers working collaboratively with students to develop meanings for required mathematical terminology. That's fine, what does that even mean? Uh, I'm going to show you a short video on the Freya model. So this is introduced on the toolkit. The actual, this actual video isn't on the toolkit, but this is an introduction for you about this, this teaching strategy of the Freya model. So I want you to have a look at this and see how this might apply when you're introducing mathematics vocabulary in your classroom.
Okay, so that's an introduction to the Freya model. Uh, you will have seen on that little video, there was this example. This example is from the literacy teaching toolkit mathematics. So that idea that we put the word in the middle of the model and then we have a definition. The definition needs to be a student-friendly definition. Our kids need to understand what the definition is. So it can't be one that's just copied straight from the dictionary. It needs to mean something to our students. Um, the top right hand side, this example has the word fact, so our students could write a fact about it. Sometimes that's a diagram, so you can get the kids to draw an image of uh, what the whatever the word is in the middle, what that represents. And then bottom left is usually for examples, and the bottom right is usually for non-examples. Uh, there's also another example of this, um, a modified Freya model in the science uh, literacy teaching toolkit. That's called a part card strategy and they add a section in there for the morphology of the word. So if you've got a word like, or uh, say, kilogram, uh, you'd have, you want to break up the morphology to say kilo, what does that actually mean? Uh, so or even a good one is perimeter. So what does peri mean, P-E-R-I? Uh, so that when our students, if we can teach what peri means, which means around the outside, we will never ever have the confusion of perimeter and area again because we know that peri means around the outside. I wish I had learned that in primary school. Uh, so that the part card strategy, check that out on the Literacy Teaching Toolkit Science. It's just an extra addition to this. So this is one teaching strategy that we can use to introduce new vocabulary to our students. Okay, I am. we are going to do this because I think this is really critical for teaching vocabulary in the maths classroom. This is that idea of looking at mathematical language versus everyday language. Uh, I'm gonna give you three minutes. This is in the supporting resources pack. And I want you to read down the left-hand side, you can see the area of challenge. So when we're introducing some mathematical language, there are a few challenges for us. And it seems to be really uh, pertinent to maths. It's not as evident in uh, other disciplines. It seems to be just for maths for some reason. So I want you to read the first column where the, the different areas when we're introducing mathematical vocabulary. I want you to read the examples and then in the final column where I have the uh, red box around the outside, I want you to have a go at thinking where do these words fit into this table? So for example, square, uh, one of the challenges around that is that there is a, uh, let's have a look, Math mathematics and everyday English share some words but they have different meanings. So square is a good example. Square has a different meaning in the mathematical classroom than what it might mean uh, somewhere else, okay? So I'm going to give you three minutes to have a look at this and I'd love to see some of your thinking in the chat about this. And what does it make you wonder or you know, any aha moments that you have around teaching vocabulary in the mathematics classroom? All right, I'll put the timer on and we'll be back in three minutes and then we're gonna wrap up um, with, the, with the last little bit of this.
Okay, sorry everyone to interrupt your time. I know three minutes isn't long enough, but I just wanted you to have a think about the complexities of some of the words our students are experiencing uh, within the maths environment. So thank you. A couple of people posted some comments in the chat. This is something that I think you could absolutely take away and look at with your department, if you're in a maths uh, department, to think about some of the, uh, the vocabulary requirements. If you go on to the birth to level 10 numeracy guide and put in vocabulary in there, you should have access to some more resources that are related to the vocabulary in this form. Of course, go on to the literacy teaching toolkit and look at that mathematical versus everyday language section as well to see what resources you can get from there. Uh, this is one more resource that isn't, it's, this is, uh, I think this is on the birth to level 10 numeracy guide, quick writes and sentence stems. This is another uh, exposure to vocabulary. Getting our kids just to write out, I thought a function was, and now I know that a function is. Compare what similar means in everyday English and what it means in mathematics. So let's be on it. Let's be open with our kids to say, we know that some of these words have different meanings. So let's talk about what is the maths meaning versus what is the meaning in everyday English. Tell the meaning of range in statistics, in studying functions and in everyday English. What idea do all the meanings share? What is special about each of the maths meanings? And what is the difference between the square of a number and the square root of a number? Now, this, these uh, quick write sentence stems in themselves, really good formative assessment for you as a maths teacher because it really helps you to understand what your students do know or, or what, they, what is their deep understanding of some of these concepts. So they're just some, that's, we just touched the surface with that idea of vocabulary in the mathematics classroom. I am going to skip over the reflection, but I, you can do that uh, on your drive home, thinking about what have I learned about vocabulary in the maths classroom? Because I just want to finish up by uh, taking you to some resources. Couple, a few resources that I recommend if you are safe. I see there's a lot of literacy leaders that are in this session. The first book, this is Disciplinary Literacy. I recommend this if you're a literacy leader and you're tasked with building the literacy knowledge of the teachers in each of the disciplines in your school because it goes into each of the discipline areas and talks about the different literacy requirements. The second book I recommend, which is, I don't know why I put, I do these out of order, but the second one is on the far end, <laughs> Adolescent Literacy in the Academic Disciplines, same thing. It's got, each of the disciplines have been separated and it talks about the different literacy requirements. And then thirdly, I'd say go to the middle, disciplinary literacy in action and you will get a copy of these slides so don't worry if you haven't been able to jot down the uh, if you haven't been able to jot down the, the names of all of those books okay and uh, while I have you here I just wanted to, to bring your attention to a couple of workshops that Basto has available uh, firstly is the literacy data or literacy leader area workshops. I better check and see if they're happening. I think just have a look on the BASTA website for information about those. But the literacy, the second one, the literacy data assessment and practice. If you're a literacy leader in a school, strongly recommend participating in this. It's a fully online course and it looks at formative assessment in literacy across the disciplines uh, in, and it's, I will warn you, this is not a number crunching exercise. It's not, uh, about, it's not about summative assessment so much as it's about formative assessment. How do our teachers really deeply get to know their students as readers, writers and vocabularians? The other thing that I'll draw your attention to is that Basto has a YouTube channel and there are some really brilliant free PDs on there uh, with some really terrific speakers. So if you have some time coming up, then... Uh, you know, holidays are coming up, so you've got to spend, sit, sit there and watch the YouTube channel with your family. They will love it, Basto's YouTube channel. Uh, some really good, good PD available on there. So we're going to finish up with the uh, success criteria. You can describe reasons why explicit teaching of disciplinary literacy is important. You can list a range of practical literacy-related activities for the mathematics classroom. You can reflect on your current practices and you can list a range of supporting resources for ongoing learning. I'm hoping that we can tick off all of those things, uh, or at least at the start of it. I did say it was a tasting plate and we've, this is just the very start of, your, of the journey of literacy and mathematics. 
finally, the very last slide, we would love your feedback. What knowledge, what resources, what supports do you want more of? So uh, this, there'll be a link put in the chat to this, but you could use the QR code as well. We are really happy to have your feedback and uh, your suggestions and ideas for further support. So I would like to thank you all for joining us here tonight. Uh, the dates for the next, if you're a literacy leader and you want to attend the next webinars, they'll be going out on the website soon. Otherwise, uh, have a good night, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the term.